Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the latest visitor actually, I will take this off, within the theoretical sciences visiting program, Jeffrey Tao. Um, Jeffrey introduces himself as a theoretical physicist specializing in topological phases of electronic condensed matter. Such phases include topological crystalline insulators and superconductors, integer and fractional quantum Hall states and spin liquids. And Jeffrey has a particular interest in the emergence of exotic quasi-particles and topological effects that exhibit fractional behaviors such as electric charge and statistics. So from my point of view, it's worth just making a quick comment on, on why that's actually quite important. So discovering fractional particles or fractional excitations and condensed matter physics is much like discovering a new particle in high energy physics. It's something with new quantum numbers. And uh, I spent my PhD working on, on that along with many others. And at that time, we considered that there wasn't really anything new to say about ordinary bands of electrons. This was a problem that was solved not so long after the advent of quantum mechanics. And you know, the textbooks said, yeah, that's it, done. However, they'd failed to think about the topology of those bands. And it turns out that that really matters, um, not least because you can get states on the surface uh, which are totally different in character from those in the bulk. So coming back to Jeffrey and being a little bit more chronological, he, you are originally from Hong Kong, I believe, and you, you studied there. A BSc, I think significantly the mathematics comes before the physics. In, in the, yeah, double major mathematics, physics, University of Hong Kong, and you stayed on to do an MPhil, which was in physics, supervised by Shadong Wang on um, the geometrical phase and spin transport, so also known as the Berry phase. Uh, and then Jeffrey moved to the University of Pennsylvania in 2006, where he pursued a, a um, PhD with Charlie Kane. And Charlie Kane had, at that point, just written the paper that pointed out that we'd all been wrong about band structures in the context of the wonder material graphene. So it's probably not an exaggeration to say that Jeffrey landed in the middle of a revolution. Uh, and there followed a string of, of, of papers um, by Jeffrey, Charlie, and collaborators addressing many aspects of topological insulators, topological superconductors, closely related semi-metals, and these have together accumulated several thousand citations. So pretty successful PhD. 2011, Jeffrey moved on to a Simons funded postdoc at Champaign Urbana. And after three years in the cornfields, he, uh, sorry, I can only say that because I, I worked in Wisconsin once. Um, he, uh, he took up his current faculty position in the University of Virginia. Um, I only really got to know Jeffrey personally very recently. I can tell you he also has a strong interest in diving. Um, and it hasn't taken you very long to get in the water since going to be out of Anyway, um, enough of me talking. Jeffrey, we're very pleased to have you here. Um, we look forward to your talk. This is moving because I'm supposed to remind you to pick up one of the karaoke microphones every time you ask a question. This is because there are people on Zoom and a recording, and the um, um, introduction will. So your question will not go across unless you use the microphone. Um, so I think I will take off my mask um, so that everyone can probably hear, hear me better. Um, so thank you, Nick, for the very, very nice uh, introduction. And um, I'd like to also thank um, OIST and TSVP in particular in uh, allowing me to visit for this uh, semester. Um, in the three weeks that I've been here already of making uh, plenty of new friends, uh, people here are really friendly, and the view is really impeccable. <laughs> so I really enjoy, uh, have been enjoying so far. Um, and today, I'm hopefully I'll uh, be able to tell you a story um, on recent developments in topological phases, and in particular, a a um, new type of uh, particle, which I call universal fractional uh, quasi-particles. So uh, here's the outline of today's talk. 
Um, so I will probably spend most of the time, maybe 30, 35 minutes on the background on um, uh, developments up to um, a few years ago. Um, so this is uh, basically some literature reviewed in um, contents that are relevant to the uh, concepts that I'm going to introduce later. Um, so the, one of the most important ingredients or, um, or toy model is the integer quantum Hall effect. Um, so I spent some time in uh, this effect and in particular focus on the uh, boundary edge channels, um, which carries all the electric and thermal response um, of this two dimensional topological phase. Um, so this is gonna lead naturally to the idea of splitting one dimensional channels um, so uh, this picture is gonna uh, come over uh, many times and I'll describe uh, in different ways that uh, one dimensional channels can be split or fractionalized uh, when you insert different topological phases uh, in, um, in materials. Um, so after that, I'm gonna switch key a little bit in introducing the uh, vortex Marana zero mode in topological superconductors or uh, chiral P plus IP superconductors. Uh, and its prospect in building a um, quantum computer. Um, so the nice uh, properties of these objects is that quantum informations are stored non-locally in space and therefore uh, they are supposed to be robust against uh, local decoherence. And um, lastly, in the background section, I'll introduce the fractional quasi-particles or more commonly known nowadays as anions. Um, in particular, in fractional quantum Hall states, which are topological phases that um, um, have long range and tangled uh, ground states. Um, and certain parts of uh, fractional anions, um, they can support universal uh, topological braiding operations, uh, which are pretty powerful and um, have um, profound impact, possibly, in um, universal topological quantum computing. Um, so here is the second part of the talk. Um, uh, which can be decomposed into three parts. Uh, the first is I want to convince you that um, Marana fermions, which I have not defined yet, is uh, some sort of a um, self-conjugate or self-hermission um, fermion operator um, that exists in a topological phase uh, with the presence of topological defects. And these known objects can actually be, can be further split in half uh, in both one-dimensional channels and zero-dimensional point particles. So in both cases, um, I want to convince you that they can be split in half with a catch. Uh, the catch is you have to introduce many body uh, strong interaction beyond the mean field paradigm. Um, so the example I'm going to give uh, the interacting superconducting topological service state. Uh, and finally, I will end today's talk uh, with uh, certain superconducting patterns. Um, that in the future might have implications in um, uh, universal quantum computing or braiding based um, universal quantum operations. Okay. All right, so I'll uh, start off with the uh, integer quantum Hall effect. Um, so uh, the first thing we want to do here is maybe we start, just start off with a piece of two dimensional metal. So you can think of this as a slab, a thin slab uh, where your two dimensional electron gas leaves. Um, and then you can hook it up with a battery and then push a current through it. Uh, so there's uh, not much interesting thing happens until maybe perhaps you put a magnetic field. Um, so here I'm gonna put a magnetic field in the uh, perpendicular direction uh, to the plane. Um, and because of the Lorentz force, um, so originally the uh, current is moving horizontally, but now because of the magnetic field, then the electron or the charge that is moving is gonna experience a Lorentz force uh, that want to push the electron or the charge in the uh, vertical direction, so in the x direction. Okay. So in this case, if the uh, material is a finite piece of uh, material, then um, there's going to be charge accumulation on both sides, um, and that is going to introduce an electric field that uh, the electric force uh, being counteracting with the uh, magnetic Lorentz force. And after the balancing out and everything in equilibrium, uh, you can measure the potential difference across um, the x direction uh, that associated with the charge accumulation. Uh, so this uh, voltage you can uh, measure using uh, a, a, a voltmeter, and that tells you what is the whole uh, voltage um, 
in this material. So there's going to be a, a potential current relation. So that's the ohmic relation, except the directions matters. So here uh, we are relating the uh, longitudinal current with the transverse uh, whole voltage. Um, and we plug in the linear response equation. And the constant we're interested in is called the uh, whole resistance. Okay, so this is just an ohmic relation. Um, it turns out that the Hall resistance is just classical Hall effect at this point. Um, the uh, classical Hall resistance is exactly the magnetic field uh, you apply to the system uh, divided by the charge density per unit area. Um, so typically what you can measure is uh, the vertical axis here is the measured Hall resistance RXY, and the horizontal axis is the applied magnetic field. So uh, as you can see, if you increase the magnetic field, then there's a linear relationship. The bigger the magnetic field, the bigger is the whole uh, resistance. Okay? Um, so there's a linear relationship. Um, up to a point where you increase the magnetic field strong enough and lower the, your temperature in your material low enough, typically in uh, the scale of one Kelvin, then you start to see steps. Okay? So this is the... Uh, onset of the integer quantum Hall effect uh, from classical uh, to quantum. Um, so we're trying to understand here, maybe for the first few slides, what's the origin of this step? And before I do so, um, they follow the following relation. So these steps here, they are quantized in uh, integers. Uh, so at each of these steps, so this is the first step is n equals 1, the second step is n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. And for each step, the resistance takes a quantized value. Sometimes it's more convenient to take the conductance, which is the reciprocal of the resistance. So conductance G is 1 over the whole resistance. So the, co the whole conductance would be integer multiple of a combination of universal constants uh, e squared over h, right? So E is the charge of an electron, h is the Planck constant. Okay? So this experiment basically tells us a way to um, find out the numerical quantity of this um, uh, combinations of universal constants, right? So this h over E squared has units in ohms. And using this technique, you can measure um, the constant h over E squared up to nowadays 13 digits. Okay, so that's the implication of the integer uh, quantum Hall effect. Um, so here's a question. Um, I'll show you two pictures. Um, before I describe the picture, there's already something strange you can um, extract from this formula. So um, n is an integer. Uh, e and h, these are universal constant. None of these numbers on the right side depend on the material detail. Okay, so it really doesn't matter what, uh, what's your 2D material, right? It can be a piece of aluminum or some uh, gallium arsenide. As long as you some uh, 2D uh, electron gas, um, then you get this pattern of steps if you lower your temperature enough uh, and if you have a big enough field. Um, and the ratio of these steps are exactly going to be, be described by this uh, relation, regardless of what material uh, you, uh, you put in. Um, so on the right side here is a potential, local potential plot. So the horizontal vertical axis are just X and Y in real space. Uh, and the color coding, uh, basically they encodes the um, electric potential of the piece of material that we're measuring. So you can see that there's a lot of disorder, uh, a lot of uh, peaks and troughs in the potential profile. So the material is dirty. And on the left-hand side is a typical picture of what uh, you would expect to use in the, uh, in the lab. Uh, this is some uh, pictures that uh, taken in the 80s. So um, it's really a piece of junk. Okay. So this means that it's very surprising that you can actually use this. Um, the only non-trivial thing in this experiment is low temperature and high field. And you can get h over e squared, this constant, up to 13 digits of accuracy. Okay, so this is really surprising, right? Because it's a, not material dependence, and b, really doesn't depend on a material detail. And even with the presence of disorder, you still get this uh, good um, accurate measurement. So why so accurate? 
right? So that's the uh, 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 what I want to mostly focus on in the first part of this talk. Um, so before I do that, maybe um, I uh, use a very crude model in describing the uh, integer quantum Hall effect. Um, so in this case, uh, it separates into the bulk and boundary degrees of freedom. Um, so the red circles here, these are the cyclotron orbits uh, of the electrons uh, when they are living inside, deep inside the bulk of the material. Um, so in the presence of the magnetic field, which in this case is perhaps pointing out of the plane, um, the magnetic field uh, allow the electrons to sort of dance in a, uh, in this case, a clockwise manner. So it gives a, a preferred handiness um, to the electrons uh, and the electron orbit in the material, right? So the electrons in the material base, basically they are localized in cyclotron orbits and they just go round and round and round and round and they cannot go anywhere. Uh, so that's why the bulk of the material is like an insulator. It doesn't allow electric transport or energy transport because the electrons cannot go anywhere except following a tight binded orbit or orbital. Um, on the other hand, on the edge, so these are the electron moles sketched by this uh, yellow uh, skipping orbit. So you can see that on the edge, then um, there's all still a preferred handedness. You still go uh, in the clockwise direction. But uh, after some time, the electron has to bounce back because there's nowhere to go, right? This is already a boundary of the system. So somehow the electron has to be reflected. And when it reflected, again, it follow a clockwise trajectory. So uh, these are called um, skipping orbits. So you can see that um, because of the handedness or the time reversal breaking from the magnetic field, um, the electrons on both sides are now propagating in the reverse directions, right? So on the left side, on the left edge, uh, electron wants to propagate downward. And on the right side, the electron wants to propagate upward. Um, so these unidirectional channels are called chiral Dirac channels. Right, so this is a consequence of um, <coughs> the magnetic field and quantum mechanics. Okay. So these are, there are some properties that are important and relevant to this talk. Um, so this is about, uh, the, the, the evidence is about bulk boundary correspondence. So um, the bulk, we have the cyclotron orbits. On the boundary, we have skipping orbits, and therefore there's a gapless chiral Dirac modes um, that uh, carries electric and energy transport on the uh, material on the edge of the material. So these yellow channels, these are single directional uh, electron channels. Uh, single direction means uh, they're chiral. Um, chiral means single directional. Um, and because the uh, material is big, so it's a, in a thermodynamic limit where the system size is big, um, the channels, the yellow channels on the left side and the right side, they don't overlap. So these are quantum mechanical uh, wave functions. Um, they have a wave packet and the wave function on the left side and right side are exponentially localized on both sides. So if the material is big enough so that the tail of the wave function don't overlap between the left and right modes, then there's no tunneling. So the electron cannot tunnel through the bulk of the material and therefore there's no scat uh, back scattering. So there's no way that the electron on the left side can go and hop to the right side if the system size is big enough. Uh, and because there's no backscattering, this means that energy and charge transport is dissipationless. So there's no way you can have any loss in energy or charge transport. Okay. So this is one of the hallmark in um, topological materials and common features in topological materials. So in ordinary materials, I like to make the analog being uh, you being inside a traffic jam, right? So the vehicle can basically can go any direction uh, they want. Um, and in this case, they are basically packed and jammed, right? Because there's too, too many backscattering, right? Between material, uh, between uh, 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 vehicles. So they can change all direction they want, and sometimes they get stuck. Um, topological material is like um, highway, or in this case, you can see that left and right uh, edge, um, they support counter propagating channels, and there's no backscattering and there's no tunneling between different channels. It's like um, you have. Um, a multi-directional highway, right? So you uh, on the on the left side, then um, the the vehicles are moving forward. On the right side, you have the uh, vehicles moving the other way, and there's really no way that the vehicles can go from one highway to another, right? 
So, um, so that's one analog. Um, and a, another key ingredient is that these uh, channels, this 1D edge channels, um, they must be supported um, as the boundary of a two-dimensional bulk. Uh, there's no way that you can have a 1D channel exist purely in one dimension as a one-dimensional wire. There's no way you can do that. Okay? Um, and uh, so this page is uh, for those who want to understand uh, why that's the case, why uh, there must be a two-dimensional bulk that supports the 1D channel. Um, basically, uh, high-energy physicists want to uh, use the term uh, gauge and gravitational anomaly. So that's something strange uh, that violates some fundamental laws of physics. So in this case, uh, for the Carroll Dirac channel, it violates charge conservation and the second law of thermodynamics. So maybe I go through the first case first. Um, so this picture here represents the 1D Carroll channel. So now you have these electrons that only move in a single forward direction. There's simply no uh, backward moving mode. So the electron can only move to the right side. And therefore, there must be a charge that is carried and a current that is carried by this uh, wire. <clears throat> so there's a relationship that uh, when you increase the uh, voltage, so increase the potential of this wire, then there's going to be an uh, increase in the current that it carries. And the relationship is exactly given by the E squared over H uh, conductance. So uh, when you increase delta V, then you get a delta I that is proportional to delta V up to the constant of E squared over H. Right? So now you can consider a system where um, I have a potential difference across. Okay? Mm -hmm. So maybe I put on some electric field so that it uh, provides me with a uh, increment in the uh, local potential. So what it means is that on maybe on the left side, it carries a current, but on the right side, because of a different uh, electric potential, it carries, carries a different current. Right? So there's going to be an unbalanced incoming and outgoing uh, current uh, from this point. So what it means is that because of the unbalanced currents, there must be charge accumulation. Right? So it's going to charge is going to accumulate more and more at this point because of the uh, potential difference and because of the unbalanced current. So at this point, you can already see there's no way that um, you have an open edge, an open line of chiral Dirac fermions. Uh, if you do, then you keep on pumping charge from one end to another. So what it means is that it cannot be a steady state because there's going to be charge accumulation on the left side and the right side indefinitely. Right? So there's no way you can have that in a steady state. And as a matter of fact, even if it's not steady, uh, it's not sustainable. So there's no way you can have a 1D chiral channel uh, on an open string. Uh, you can ask, okay, what if I put it on a ring? Right? So now um, there is no, uh, there's no end, right? But if you put it on a ring, um, I can imagine putting on a magnetic field uh, through the ring and a diabetically turning up the magnetic field. So the magnetic field becomes stronger and stronger and stronger as a function of time. Um, and according to the Faraday's law, uh, that introduces an electromotive force around the ring basically an electric field around the ring. Um, and because of the electric field, there's going to be a potential uh, modulation. So the potential is going to increase uh, uh, all over the ring. So then um, you basically have charge accumulation everywhere um, because of the changing uh, or the, the increment of the magnetic flux you pass through. Uh, so that's obviously violates charge conservation, right? So you can put this ring, uh, if it exists on a pure one d system, in vacuum. and if you pass a magnetic through it, uh, this the theory tells you that you're gonna get more and more and more charge. Right? So that obviously uh, violates charge conservation. Right? So there's no way this can happen in nature. Right? So the way to rescue this paradox or anomaly is to allow this and um, allow this uh, Carroll Dirac mode to be present on the boundary edge of a 2D system. So in this case, the charge accumulation is actually supported by the two-dimensional bulk whose boundary is the 1D edge that uh, holds the Carroll Dirac fermion. So the charge accumulation comes from um, a bulk insulator, a topological insulator that supports uh, this Carroll channel. Uh, so the second violation is the violation of the second law, right? So you can, if this uh, 1D system exists, then I can connect um, using this uh, 1D Carroll Dirac channel to connect a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir, right? So in this case, then uh, because the uh, electron only moves in a forward direction, it carries also energy, 
So this is going to be a case that uh, directs um, heat currents from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir, and therefore it violates the uh, second law of thermodynamics. So there's no way that this can happen unless you have uh, you can violate the second law, right? Um, so the way to rescue this is to re realize that the 1D edge channel must be present um, on the edge of a topological bulk. And in this case, if you insist on connecting with a cold and a hot reservoir, uh, the edge channel must come in pairs because the, um, the topological bulk must have two edges uh, that connect the hot and cold with counter-propagating um, uh, directions. So one with forward and the other one, uh, the opposite edge is going to have a uh, counter-propagating direction. Um, so overall, uh, it will rescue the second law. Okay? So all these basically are very solid arguments in convincing us that these 1D chiral channels must leave on the boundary of a 2D topological bulk. So that's one of the um, key idea in uh, relating the boundary and the bulk of a topological insulator. Okay? So then you can ask what kind of topology are encoded in the bulk. Uh, so here I'd like to make an uh, analogy to the gauss bonnet theorem. Um, so here the picture here uh, shows you two geometric surfaces. Um, on the left side, you have a sphere um, with no holes. And on the right side, you have a torus, which is the surface of a donut. Okay? Uh, so the gauss bonnet theorem is an equation uh, that relates the topological quantity on the left side. Uh, G here is called a genus. So zero for the sphere, one uh, for the torus, um, two an integral or sum over a geometrical quantity called the Gaussian curvature. Right? So if you sum over the curvature uh, over the entire surface, then you get a quantity, a topological quantity, uh, which tells you the how many holes was the genus of this surface. So you can uh, sort of verify this by seeing that. Um, everywhere on the sphere, you have a positively curved point. So when you sum over the uh, uh, curvature, the, the, the quantity should be positive. And indeed it is, because the genus on, of a sphere is zero. So the left-hand side of this equation is positive, And so is the right-hand side, because the curvature is everywhere positive. Um, on the other hand, for the torus, uh, depending on what point you're looking at on the torus, you can either have positive or negative curvature. right? So if you are um, standing on the edge of the torus, it's positively curved. But if you are sitting inside, right, uh, on the inner rim of the torus, then it's negatively curved. So you have as many positively curved points as negatively curved ones. And therefore, when you sum them up, they cancel. It's zero. And then you put in the numbers g equals one for the torus. Then on the left hand side of the equation, indeed, you get zero. Okay, so that's the gauss bonnet uh, theorem that relates topological quantities uh, with some geometrical ones. Right. So you can also see that um, the topological quantity will not change um, with, if you do deformation. So un unless you uh, use a pair of scissors and punch holes into your surface, if you don't do that, uh, no matter what deformation you do, uh, the genus quantity on the left side is going to stay unchanged. Uh, the curvature, uh, the quantity in the integrand on the right-hand side, uh, that is going to change um, uh, quite a lot if you um, deform your surface. But the sum of all the curvatures will not change. Right? So if you integrate the, the curvature, uh, although the curvature can change drastically from point to point, if you do deformation, the sum does not change. So applying this idea, then um, Talos and his collaborator uh, used the Kubo formula to um, basically a linear response theory uh, to compute what is the conductance in um, the materials and uh, this is the formula that they, um, they uh, derived and proved. Okay, so this is called the TKN formula, or mathematician call it the first churn number. Uh, so basically, this number here is a analog of the right-hand side of the gauss bonnet uh, theorem. Uh, the integrand here is not the Gaussian curvature, but rather uh, it's called a Berry curvature. It's like a momentum space version of curvature. And it encodes the information about the ground state of your system, so the lowest energy level uh, in, the, in the system. Um, and the whole integrand here um, encodes uh, quantum entanglements if this integral is not managing. Um, so there are more recent generalization of uh, topological phases in two and three dimensions. 
Um, so in 2D integer quantum Hall effects requires time reversal breaking and the presence of a magnetic field or magnetization. Um, you can have topological insulators that preserve time reversal symmetry. Uh, so in this case, uh, the example would be quantum Hall, a spin Hall insulator. Uh, so in this case, you have a, a trivial, uh, not trivial, but topological um, insulating bulk whose boundary carries a, a pair of counter propagating channels. Um, so you have spin up electron move in one way and spin down electron move in the opposite directions. Um, so these channels, uh, again, they cannot exist alone as a pure 1D system with time reversal symmetry. They must exist um, and supported uh, by a two-dimensional topological bulk. Uh, so this also, uh, the same similar idea can be present in three dimensions. So you can have three-dimensional topological insulators which support um, massless surface uh, Dirac fermions. Uh, which is already a fractional version of graphene. So in, uh, if, uh, for those who are familiar with graphene, which is one atomic layer of um, graphite, of carbon uh, atoms, um, in that material, you have four Dirac cones, uh, one at each K point, and at each K point, you have spin degeneracy. So you have two Dirac cones per each K point, you have two K points, you have four Dirac cones in general. Um, so this is uh, this system, the surface supports of one fourth of the degrees of freedom of graphene. So that's fractionalization due to the presence of topology in the bulk. Um, so you can, uh, in fact, you can measure this using ARPA's uh, angle resolved photoemission uh, spectroscopy, uh, map to map out the uh, energy um, to momentum dispersion relation. And sometimes you can even do spin resolve ARPA's. Um, then you can see that there's going to be spin polarization on the Fermi surface. Um, along the um, uh, surface Dirac fermion, um, and the spin orientation and the momentum is locked in a helical manner. Okay, so these are review on topological insulators and uh, in two and three dimensions. So let me go back to the one-dimensional channels that focus of this talk. Um, so the simplest um, truly one-dimensional uh, degrees of freedom that you can write down, the simplest, uh, lowest degrees of freedom you can write down with time real symmetry and all that uh, in one dimension is the following. So you basically just take a one dimensional system with P squared over 2M energy dis uh, dispersion. Um, and this parabolic dispersion is, has to be spin degenerate because uh, electron is a fermion, it comes with spin, it's a spin one half um, uh, particle. So it comes with spin up and spin down species. Um, and uh, because of the power exclusion principle and the Fermi statistics of the uh, electrons uh, 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 theory tells us that um, at zero temperature, um, you occupied your electron states up to a Fermi level below which all the electron states are occupied above which all the electron states are empty. So that defines you with a Fermi level. And at the Fermi level, you can cut across this energy band, this P square over 2M band or K square over 2M band. Um, and depending on the slope of this dispersion, if the slope is positive, then you get right moving uh, channels. If the slope is negative, you get left moving channels. And for each uh, uh, Fermi points, you get a spin up and spin down electron. And therefore, there are four channels in total. Right? Uh, two spin up, two spin down, uh, a pair moving to the left, a pair moving to the right. right. So that's the lowest degrees of freedom you can have in a true 1D system. Um, you can fractionalize or split this um, 1D degrees of freedom by inserting a quantum spin hole insulator. So if you do that, then um, these channels got uh, decomposed spatially. So this is really in real space. Uh, and the materials um, nowadays, the most common material is either um, mercury, cadmium, telluride, the first quantum spin hole uh, material, or uh, you, can you can take indium arsenide, um, gallium, and timonite uh, heterostructures, or monolayer tungsten ditellurite. So these are uh, good candidates uh, for quantum spin hole insulator. And if you do that, then you can split um, the fundamental 1D electron channels uh, into two pairs of helical um, Dirac channels. Each helical pair contains um, spin up electron moving in one way and spin down electron moving the other. Okay. Um, further, you can insert a quantum hole uh, insulator. So that's the same quantum hole insulator that we have discussed previously. Or more contemporarily, uh, instead of applying a magnetic field, um, you can apply a magnetization without the need of a magnetic field in manganese, dope, uh, bismuth, selenite, uh, thin field. 
Uh, so in this case, that's a quantum anomalous Hall insulator uh, that allows you to further decompose these modes. So now um, here you lower the symmetry. In the quantum spin Hall case, you have time reversal symmetry. In the anomalous Hall case, uh, you violate time reversal symmetry by either putting on a magnetic field or a magnetization. And the consequence of that is it allows you to further split the helical Dirac channels into chiral ones. So chiral means electrons only want to move in a single forward direction without a counterpropagating channel. And so you can see that now on the top edge, for example, the electron only wants to move in a single forward direction. Um, that's not the end of the story. So it turns out if you lower symmetry enough, so here at the middle, you uh, destroy time reversal symmetry. On the far right, uh, you can further destroy the charge conservation symmetry by putting on a um, superconductor. So there's a couple of ways to do this. One is you insert a chiral P plus IP superconductor. The other way is you start with this manganese doped uh, bismuth selenide and you put on a strongly coupled um, uh, superconductor uh, and induce proximity uh, superconducting pairing to the material. Uh, so if that's the case, you can further decompose this Carl Dirac fermions into two Maranas. So what are Marana fermions? Um, so if you write down um, an electron theory, so electron is described by a complex Dirac fermions. Complex means for the electron wave function, you can apply a complex phase e to the i phi. Um, because it's a complex uh, wave function, this is complex operators, and you can decompose a complex uh, Dirac electron operator into real and imaginary components, right? So this are uh, called Marana components of Dirac fermions. So each Dirac fermion comes with two Marana fermions. Uh, one is its real part, the other one is its imaginary part, right? So each one, uh, their own self partner or anti partners. So this means that they're self conjugated. They are, they are their own anti particles. Okay, so they satisfy this reality condition, and it's exactly this type of fermions that is propagating along um, the edge of this chiral superconductor, uh, which carries half of the degrees of freedom of the edge of the quantum hole. Okay. Um, so to see this, the, this uh, factor of one half exactly describe um, the uh, response. So this equation here basically tells you roughly uh, how much uh, thermal current, heat current is carried by the edge channel. So the C number here would be one for the edge mode of a quantum hole, the Dirac, the chiral Dirac uh, channel. Uh, it is one half um, for the chiral uh, superconductor, which uh, supports the Marana fermion. So Marana fermion is C equals one half, carry half of the thermal heat current as the Dirac fermion. Uh, so this is a little bit of details that is uh, necessary in this talk about uh, chiral superconductors. Um, so superconductor in general uh, exists because of electron pairing. Um, so here the uh, electron in uh, minus k, k is momentum, uh, want to pair up uh, with the electron in positive k. Um, and these uh, electron pair called Cooper pairs condense in the ground state. Um, so the order parameter, which is the ground state expectation value of the Cooper pair, uh, is uh, encoding a complex phase, right? It, it, it can be a complex phase because the uh, Dirac electron of um, the uh, Dirac electron operator is a complex operator. So it has a complex phase associated with this. And this phase phi here is called a superconducting phase. Okay. So this superconducting phase in general can modulate slowly in space without destroying the uh, superconductor. Um, so here, each arrow here uh, represents the value the uh, value of this complex phase phi. Um, so this on the diagram on the left-hand side is uh, plot in real space. So the arrow here at different point can take different directions and that represents phi, the value of phi being slowly modulated uh, or wind around the vortex in, uh, in two dimensions. So uh, at the center of this vortex here is a, uh, a magnetic vortex core. Um, so there's a magnetic flux with value hc over two e uh, passing across this uh, region. Um, so what it's going to do to the system is it's going to introduce this winding pattern of the magnetic uh, of the uh, superconducting pairing phase. Right? So this phi value, this uh, superconducting pairing phase value, is going to wind by two pi as you go once around the vortex core. And the consequence of that 
in the Cairo Hippolytus IP superconductor or topological uh, superconductor in general is that that's going to trap a Marana zero mode. So there's a zero energy, zero momentum Marana fermion mode that is trapped inside uh, close to the center of this um, vortex. Uh, so the combination of these two effects, the magnetic flux together with the uh, zero energy Marana bound state is called an Eisen quasi particle. Okay. So this is one of the uh, basis of um, uh, the simplest topological quantum computer you can have. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, we can count the quantum information that is stored uh, in this system. Um, so uh, the, uh, each pair of zero mode forms a two-level system uh, because you can combine uh, each pair of Maranas to form a complex Dirac fermion, and that uh, fermion state can either be empty or occupied. So each pair of zero mode or each pair of vortices um, corresponds to a single two-level uh, quantum system. But the key point is um, the location of these two, these two vortices can be very far apart. Um, and the consequence of that is it stores uh, quantum information on locally and therefore coherently, right? So if you imagine there's some local perturbation or accidental measurements, um, so here I introduce a local uh, uh, scalar potential uh, perturbation. So I just put on some electric uh, uh, perturbation. So um, there's no way that it can couple to the charge that is associated or the, uh, uh, the quantum state associated to this pair of uh, zero mode uh, because the zero modes are so far apart um, so that the wave function, they don't overlap. Um, when you put on a local perturbation, uh, which is this, uh, uh, represented by this Gaussian packet of Vx, um, so that uh, can only uh, overlap one of the two um, uh, uh, zero mode wave packets, um, if at all overlapping with any of them. So this means that the, um, the, the tunneling or the perturbation has to be uh, exactly vanishing unless you put these two zero mode uh, close enough so that you can measure it. So if they're not close enough, if they're very uh, uh, well separated in space, there's no way there's local uh, perturbation that can destroy the quantum state. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it, uh, this system is still, this quantum state is still successful and um, to, to fermion poisoning. Uh, so that, for example, if you stick an STM tube and um, tunnel electrons, which is a fermion, um, in and out of one of the two uh, Marana zero mode, then it can change the parity of the quantum state. So this state is still not robust against uh, fermion uh, poisoning. Um, so it can form a universal quantum, uh, not universal, but uh, still uh, braiding operations uh, because uh, you have non-abelian um, exchange operations. Uh, for example, if I put in a closed system four vortices, uh, so it associates with a two-dimensional Hilbert space, and for the pure states, I can enumerate this on the block sphere. Um, and if you do exchange operations, uh, basically in this case, you can either have operation uh, that rotates nine degrees uh, on the block sphere in two orthogonal axes. And if you do a random braiding operation, uh, basically, you can not cover the block sphere. You can only generically get um, 24 states. So if you uh, start off with any arbitrary or generic quantum state and apply any operation, braiding operations you want, you are going to create new state, but you're not going to cover the entire block sphere. You can only generically uh, uh, create 24 states out of any given state, uh, initial state. So that's not very good because um, you really want uh, for uh, braiding operation to be uniform to be uh, able to cover all states on the block sphere. Okay. So to do that, then um, uh, we move on to fractional systems. Uh, so in fractional quantum Hall states, um, if you lower the temperature further to millikelvin, then you start to see fractional filling numbers. So this n number becomes a fraction. Uh, so the uh, simplest example is the laughing one third state. Um, where the n number is one third. And in this case, uh, electrons are further uh, fractionalized into um, E over three uh, quasi-particle excitations called anions. Uh, so no longer, uh, 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 they not only carry fractional charge, but also fractional statistics. So for normal electrons, if you do exchange, you get minus one exchange phase. Um, for these fractional quasi-particles, uh, for Laughlin, one third uh, quasi-particle, if you do exchange, that you add up with a 
uh, complex phase, which is not plus one or minus one as in boson or fermions. So there are different types of anions, um, and depending on what you want, um, you might want the more exotic ones to support uh, braiding-based universal uh, operations. So for abelian anions like laughing anions, um, these are no good uh, in quantum computing or quantum information storage because quantum states are still local. Uh, for non-abelian anions, uh, these are now better anions that you can store information on locally in space, pretty much like the icing uh, quasi-particles we um, discussed uh, in previous pages. Um, so in this case, you can have icing anion in the uh, filling five half fractional quantum Hall state. Um, these are good in storing quantum information, but not so good in manipulation in unitary braiding operations, uh, because um, the braiding operations are not universal. So in the previous page, we have seen that uh, it can only cover 24 points on the block sphere, so it's not universal at all. Um, there are better anions. Uh, one of the uh, good ones are called the Fibonacci anions. Uh, so they are proposed to exist in the read resi fractional quantum Hall state at filling 12 fifth. Uh, so these anions are good enough in, um, in doing universal quantum operations. Um, so I'm going to skip over the uh, counting of the quantum states. So these are called Fibonacci anions, basically, because if you have more and more uh, Fibonacci anions, then the uh, dimension of your Hilbert space grows uh, according to the Fibonacci sequence. So that's why uh, they're called Fibonacci anions. Uh, more importantly, uh, what I want to show you is that it indeed um, is universal, right? So if I have a closed system with four Fibonacci's, then it forms a two-level system. Right? I have to uh, do a little bit of explaining before I can convince you that, but believe me, it's going to form a two-level system, and therefore I can describe the quantum states on a block sphere. So I can do exchanges, uh, different type of exchanges. Maybe I can exchange the first two Fibonacci's, or I can exchange a second and a third Fibonacci's, and they generate a bunch of braiding operations. Um, so these two operations, they um, can be represented by three power over five rotations on the block sphere. Um, and the funny thing is that they, uh, the axis of the rotation is some uh, irrational angle. So if I do random braiding operations, right? so what I'm doing here is that I'm start with some uh, generic state, and then I'm going to do some random braiding operation, right? Maybe I do B1, B2, B2, B1, 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 B2, B2, some braiding, uh, random uh, combinations. So the simulation goes as the following. So if you, uh, as, as you increase the number of random braiding operations, you can see that now you get more and more and more and more states, and eventually it covers the block sphere densely. Uh, what it means is that you can start off with any initial generic quantum state, and you can approximate any other arbitrary quantum state to arbitrary accuracy in a finite step braiding process. Right? So that's what it means by having a universal braiding uh, operation, a set of universal braiding operations. Uh, so the problem about that is um, these are actually the confined excitations. So they are prone to thermal excitations and thermal fluctuations, right? So if you, even if you cool it down into millikelvin, you will never be able to actually go to zero Kelvin. So you always have thermal uh, fluctuations, some uh, temperature profile on your sample, and your sample is always a thermodynamic limit, right? So you always have a big sample with uh, a big, like 10 to the 23 number of electrons. So you have many, uh, it's a many body system. So, um, in this thermodynamic limit, you must, because of thermal fluctuation, uh, cannot avoid the uh, presence of accidental spontaneous creation of these uh, Fibonacci anions. And the spontaneous creation of them will eventually cause error in your braiding operations and also cause error in uh, measuring your quantum state due to anion poisoning. Okay. So that's, these are uh, undesirable properties that you cannot avoid uh, if you use anions as building blocks of um, quantum operations. Um, so let me skip the quick summary and maybe give you the punchline. Um, so to that, the best way to um, manipulate uh, topological properties and topological defects is to introduce a new types of uh, quasi-particle, which are called universal fractional quasi-particles that bypass all these um, challenging, uh, undesirable um, properties. So the definition is that um, they better be non-abelian, right? So uh, the quantum state should be able to be stored non-locally in space. 
uh, so that is it is not prone to local decoherence. Uh, second, the braiding operation should be uh, universal. So it, uh, in a two-level system, it covers the block sphere densely. And third, um, the point particle better be confined. So they should not be the confined quantum excitations, meaning that they should not be able to just spawn spontaneously uh, due to uh, thermal fluctuation. Um, so one way to do this is to um, perhaps uh, realize them in uh, interacting um, Morana fermions. Okay. So I go back to this picture, and um, this is actually uh, related to the following question. So in this picture, I've shown you by inserting different topological states, you can continuously sort of, uh, not continuous, but in steps, uh, splitting your fundamental channel into smaller and smaller and smaller components. Up to this point, you have a single Morana uh, channel on the edge of a topological superconductor. Um, so these are all materials that are topological, but they're short range entangled in the sense that they can be all understood in mean field single body theory. Um, so the question is, can you further split this in half? Can you further split a Morana fermion in half? Okay, so I want to convince you that uh, this is indeed possible. Um, but there's a catch. The catch is you have to introduce many body interaction to make this happen. So there's no way uh, this can be done if you are in the single body mean field paradigm. Um, so the way to do this is to insert um, on the surface of a topological insulator a um, topological ordered surface state which preserve time resolution symmetry. Right, so uh, here in the bulk, 3D bulk, I have a topological superconductor whose surface is the Marana version of the service Dirac cone of a topological insulator. So on that surface, you can break time reversal in two different manners. And uh, on the domain wall, the junction is going to carry a single chiral Marana fermion. And this fermion can be split in half if you insert a third domain uh, that allows you to gap out the surface state of a superconductor, a topological superconductor, by many body strong interaction. So using that, uh, there's a way you can write down the interaction precisely in an exactly solvable manner that perhaps I do not have time to go through in this talk. Um, and if you tweak it a, a little bit, then you can actually even uh, reduce the system to uh, avoid having a topologically ordered service state, but instead only use a scheme that involves single body mean field uh, theory almost everywhere, except on this dashed line uh, on a superconducting pattern to get fractional uh, quasi particle, uh, which by, part, uh, by partition the, um, uh, the ice and quasi particle. Right, so I'm going to skip this. But the most important concept is what we have uh, discussed so far is the electron is a fermion, it's a Dirac fermion. Uh, you can decompose it into the real and uh, imaginary parts. So those are the Marana components of a fermion. And we can use interaction to further decompose the Marana components into. Uh, fractional components, which I call uh, universal fractional quasi particles. Okay. So um, these quasi particles can be done in an inter interaction manner. So I'm going to skip this page. Um, but the uh, setup is the following. So you start with an insulator that is topological. And Fu and Kane uh, in 2008 show us that if I pass through, uh, pass a magnetic flux of H silver 2E through the heterostructure, then there's going to be a zero energy Marana bound state. Um, so on the superconducting pattern, uh, it can be realized in the following manner. So the bulk is a topological insulator, consider bismuth selenite. And on the surface, you put on proximity induced topological surface state. So you put on, on different uh, uh, plates, uh, you put on some superconductor, and they can have different phases uh, because uh, of the Josephson effect. So you can pass the supercurrents to change the uh, mutual phase uh, in between the uh, adjacent uh, superconducting plates. So if you do that, um, depending on the phase configuration, uh, sometimes you get Marana zero mode at the tri junction. And in situation where you have a pi junction where the red and the green superconducting plate are off by a superconducting phase of exactly pi. So in this case, the Marana zero mode is going to be delocalized along this 1D junction. And that's the end of the story in the single body non uh, mean field uh, non interacting setting. Uh, with interaction, on the other hand, there's a way, there's a third axis uh, that you can gap out and introduce a many body mass uh, on this 1D junction, the pi junction. And the result of that is going to 
uh, leads you to fractional uh, universal quasi-particles, which are labeled by alpha and beta on these two, jun uh, on these two uh, tri-junctions point defects. Okay. Um, so I'll show you a final slide. So uh, this is a detailed slide. I uh, just want to show you that uh, it, uh, there's some calculation that can be done. And the result is um, I'll have a block sphere with different braiding operations. So in this case, I should mention, I put four of these uh, quality particle on a closed system, and that's going to form me a two-level system. And then I can do a mutual exchange between different pairs of quality particles, and that corresponds to some powerful rotation in the block sphere that is off by uh, their axis is off by some irrational angle. And pretty much like the Fibonacci case, uh, if I do random sequence of random operation, then you can see that it pretty much cover the block sphere densely pretty quickly. So this means that again, if you start with any arbitrary initial state, generic uh, initial state, you can approach and approximate any other arbitrary state to arbitrary accuracy in um, a finite step rating process. Right. Um, and even better, uh, unlike the Eisen quasi particle, which is prone to fermion poisoning, uh, these type of quasi particle can encode quantum information that is even robust against uh, fermion poisoning. And the reason is because now the zero energy Marana bound state is split fractionalized non locally in space so that these alpha and beta quasi particles can be well separated. And if you put an SDM tube or any source of the fermion, um, tunneling, uh, there's no way that you can cover both alpha and beta simultaneously because now they are separated say, spatially. Right? So the wave function, they do not overlap. And therefore, the first fermion poisoning channel is exactly vanishing. So there's no way you can um, destroy um, the quantum states even by um, adding or subtracting um, um, fermions locally. Okay? So this means that the quantum state is really, really protected. Um, so I think because of time, I'm going to skip uh, the details of the interactions. Um, so the only thing I want to say is that this interaction in a, as a model can be written down exactly precisely uh, as a four fermion two body interaction. And um, instead of single body um, Marana mass, there's a three body Marana mass that you can write down to uh, describe the ground state of this system, and depending on the mutual signs, uh, the pi junction take different phases, and at the domain wall, that is going to trap these uh, universal quality particles. Um, so these are all unpublished work. Uh, so hopefully, uh, by the end of my stay uh, in July, uh, I can have a more um, complete story that I can tell you um, after publishing this, perhaps. Okay. Right, so I'll uh, end today's talk with a summary. So um, I fake the connection and correspondence between topological phases and fractionalization in both 1D channels and zero-dimensional quasi-particles. Um, and hopefully I can uh, you know, um, not really prove, but convince you that um, Marana splitting is possible in the presence of many-body interactions, um, and in particular in this particular superconducting uh, pattern um, using a topological insulator. And here's a couple of uh, directions. Um, so first is how do we actually realize this uh, type of interactions in a real system? Um, so that requires strong correlation, uh, a strong correlated system, um, and is uh, in theory a numerical work and a few theoretical um, uh, problem. And the second is um, I only make suggestions that these are universal braiding operations, uh, but there's still a second step in promoting these into building a uh, topological quantum computer that is universe, uh, universal. So the uh, protocol in making this happen is still unknown. Right? So that's uh, two important future uh, directions in my opinion. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Um, questions? Sir. And yes, please do use the microphone. Hello? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. That was really cool. Um, the So one way with icing anions to get them confined is you can like uh, kind of simulate them using 
defects in like the Toric code phase at the end points yes. of like a domain wall? Yes. Um, is this something similar? Like yes. So um, I, I should make the distinction if I have time uh, between the ice and anion in the Moritz Fafian state versus the CO energy Marana bound state that, for example, you mentioned in the dislocation of the Toric code. So the former, um, the anion, the ice and anion excitations in the Fafian state is a deconfined excitation. So it's a dynamical excitation in the quantum Hamiltonian. On the other hand, um, the vortex state um, I presented like these guys. So you can think of this as a vortex on a uh, Carroll P wave superconductor. Um, that is analogous to the dislocation case that you mentioned in the Toric code, both being um, externally introduced to the system. So themselves, they are classical objects. Uh, the quantum mechanics comes from the electronic degrees of freedom within. So it's a mixture between a classical object and a quantum object. So the classical one being, for example, the vortex configuration. So that's a classical configuration. And the quantum mechanics is the fermionic degrees of freedom from the electrons. Right? So it's a mixture between the two, and that makes them confined because they cannot be freely flowing around, uh, not like the, the confined ice and anion in the Fafian state. So once they arise, for example, from thermal fluctuations, they can be freely moved around without any energy cost. But for the vortex state or the dislocation state in a uh, case in the toric code, there's always a confining energy um, uh, if you want to pull apart a pair of dislocations or vortices. So those are actually desirable for the purpose of uh, braiding operation because it allows you to um, avoid them to, be, um, to, 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 to introduce any errors in your braiding operations. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess my, my question was like for the, these fractionalized ones yes. that you have here, it looks like these are also living at like the intersections of domain walls between the superconducting phases, right? So yes. is there like an interpretation of these? Can I, could I define some kind of error correcting code? I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's the thing that I skipped. <laughs> Uh, so if, if time allowed, I, I could uh, actually describe more on this page. So basically, that's the page. Uh, this is the picture that relates to the dislocation in Tori yeah, yeah. code, right? Yes, yeah, so I know these. Um, I've, I've worked on these before. Right. So, I know so, so, so then the issue is for twist defects. Uh, it turns out that braiding alone is not universal. So there's no way there's a theorem. Um, there's no way you can get universal braiding operation from twist defect alone. Um, if you want, you can do measurement. Uh, and if you have a measurement-based quantum computer, uh, that can be universal, but I would say that's still undesirable because you are somewhat throwing dice and wait for what to happen because there's no way you can control the state, um, the outcome that you measure, right? So if you do some quantum uh, measurements of, of some quantum states, then it either can be zero or one, and the outcome is always randomized. And you have to, there's no way you can, you can have a well-controlled uh, number of operations if you want to go from A to B, right? So, so it, it's always a random process. So that's why um, I would argue that uh, it's somewhat undesirable. On the other hand, you want some braiding operation from confined defects that are universal. So, uh, so they must follow these uh, definitions. So there has to be confined. The braider has to be universal, and they have to store uh, information on locally. And, and these cannot be realized uh, in typical twist defects. So it has to be something else. Um, and one of these examples uh, is defects of this sort. So how, do, how does this differ from the twist defect? Yeah, so there's no group associated to it. So in, in the twist defect case, so for example, for this location, let me go back to this diagram. Um, there's a um, Kitev want to call weak symmetry breaking. Basically, it's a symmetry group associated with the yeah, topological it's just order. automorphism group of anion yeah. model. Right? So, yeah, so the anion um, structure, they, they are symmetric under some uh, symmetry group. Um, so if you have that, then you can prove that if your underlying topological phase is abelian, 
Um, all you can get is a fusion rule that is similar to this, and this can never be uh, universal. So for example, if I go back to the fusion rule for Fibonacci, uh, maybe I can, I don't need the board, maybe I just use um, the equation I have, right? So if you look at the Fibonacci fusion rule, which is a, uh, the Fibonacci is a uh, universal uh, object, um, this fusion rule cannot be satisfied by any group relation, right? So um, the distinction is here, I have a Z2 group. So the defects um, is represented by the non-trivial elements in Z2. So Z2 is just one and minus one. Um, so I can associate a Z2 number uh, to these objects in the equation, right? So uh, sigma has the quantum number of minus one. So 